All right, we are here at the ARS site in Mandan, North Dakota, and we're here with Christine Nichols, who is a research soil microbiologist with them. Um, Christine, you and I have corresponded back and forth probably for the last three or four years. Yes. And so I really appreciate some of those beautiful pictures you give me of soil microbes. And, um, but here's something that you probably don't know but I got my start in soil biology from you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> soil microbiology, I had no clue. And so I watched the, one of the um, videos that you did on, in the great, in the Northern Plains soil health uh, lectures. Okay. And one of them was yours, and that's basically where I started. And in fact, my class watches your video as well every year. <laughs> I have a soils well, class. I think it's the only environmental soils class in the University of South Carolina. Okay. So. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, so it's really good at last to be here. Um, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your work. First, um, if you could sort of explain in general terms what your work is over here uh, at the ARS. Um, well, I work mostly with a soil fungus called a vascular mycorrhizal fungi. Okay. Um, and that, in Greek, it literally means uh, tree-like um, fungus root fungi. <laughs> so that, that kind of goes with what they look like. They yes. form tree-shaped structures yes. inside the roots, um, and then they branch out into the soil. And that's one of them next to you there. Yes, right? yep, okay. yep. So this is an image of, of them in inside the roots. Um, the arescuals are really branch structures. It's a little bit hard hard to see them inside the roots because right. um, they're very much layered on top of each other. But you can see all the hyphae that will extend out. Um, oh, from that, and that's a root hair you have there. Um, actually, all of this is, this is actually a, a piece of root. Yes. Um, so it's, it's a, um, not a root hair, but all of this okay. then is the fungal hyphae. Yes, okay. Um, the root hairs would be, they're a little bit smaller okay. and straighter. They don't um, they don't bend as, they don't bend as much yeah. as, as the mycorrhizal hyphae does. Okay. And that bending is an advantage because it allows them to explore much more of the soil environment and right. be able to access more of those nutrients. Um, and where I've kind of gone in a lot of my interest is, is focusing on these fungi, but um, looking at uh, some substances they produce mm -hmm. that may help with uh, soil aggregation and create better soil structure for better water infiltration and water holding capacity and air movement to help with the roots as well as the microbes to grow. Um, wow, that sounds good. So we're going to have to back up a little bit because you've preempted me on that one. <laughs> okay, so let's back up a little bit. Explain to me what are, what are, bus, what, what, are uh, what are these mycorrhizal fungi? What do they kind of look like? And w well, let's look at that, and then what's their role in the soil okay. in general? Yeah, um, these fungi, their body structures are basically these strands of fungal hyphae. Okay. And inside the, the roots, they form this tree-shaped structure, and it's all just very fine branches of that hyphae. Yes. Um, and these fungi actually evolved with the first land plants. Yes. So in order for plants to, to colonize land, um, and grow uh, larger than single cell um, algae or things like that that right. were in the ocean, um, they needed to have sort of a resource to be able to get nutrients from what was not really soil at that time. Yes. And so the mycorrhizal fungi was the, the mechanism. Their bodies are these strands of fungal hyphae. That's Got their it. main part of their body. Um, and they do produce reproductive structures yes. that are called spores. Okay. Um, and they come in various shapes and sizes and colors, um, but they're, for the most part, they're kind of a balloon type shaped structure. You'll see the, the hyphae attached to the spores. Okay. Um, and I'll uh, hopefully be able to get you some images of some spores as well, so you're able to, to see that, okay. um, yeah. what they look like. Um, and so it's, it's really kind of, of nice to be able to see 
um, these, these structures that are in the soil. And what they do is they can have better access to the soil environment. It's, yep. it's called a better surface area to volume ratio. Okay. So just like if you think of a tree growing above ground, yes. in order for it to conduct adequate amount of photosynthesis, yes. it needs to have leaves on branches so there's always leaves that can get access to sunlight. Some will be in shade, but there's always some that get access. Yes. The same thing happens with the mycorrhizal fungi. They form these tree-shaped structures inside the roots. Yes. And inside the roots in those tree-shaped structures, they grow through the root cell wall and up to the plasma membrane of the, the root cell. Yes. And then they deliver nutrients and water that they gather from out into the soil. So then they go out into the soil with these hyphal strands and then at the end, you won't even be able to see them here. Um, most of them have been cut off in the okay. process of isolating the roots. Um, but they'll form another sort of, like the arbuscule, a very highly branched structure. Yes. And that allows them to do a very efficient gathering of water and nutrients in the soil. And then they can bring those back through that hyphal pipeline yes. into the roots. And then it, there's no real loss because they go right into the roots and right up to the, the cell membrane yes. in delivering these nutrients. And then they take from the plant carbon that the plant makes via photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. and so, that, so that's kind of the symbiotic relationship? Yes. They're out there getting what, is it water or water and nutrients? Or? Water and nutrients. Yes. So they're out there extending, they're actually anchored in the, the, the root of the plant and they go out and extend that root system way beyond what root hairs could go. Yes. Yeah. Bring it all back, but there's a there's a payoff for them. They get carbon. Yeah, yeah. It's so. it's a you know pay as you go type of system. Right. You, you have to the plant has to pay for those with that carbon. Okay. And then that carbon can be used to extend the hyphae even further right. out into the soil. Yes. It can also be used to make the substances like glomalin that can help with soil irrigation and building um, soil structure. Okay. As well as there's there's a lot of interest now occurring with interactions that um, happen along the hyphae. Actually, they'll be colonized by bacteria yes. and that bacteria can get some of that carbon from the fungus yes. and the bacteria are really important in being able to release some of the nutrients that are bound. Okay. Um, there's a, a particular type of bacteria that's a phosphate solubilizing bacteria that actually grows um, along the hyphae and then that's able to release phosphate when it's, okay. when it's in that sort of mineralized form and it's unavailable. Yeah. A lot of phosphorus in our right. soils are unavailable because yeah. it gets readily bound with various cations. Mm -hmm. Is this the enzyme phosphatase or is that just one of them? Um, it's a phosphatase type of enzyme okay. that they use um, to be able to, to do that release to get yeah. those, those phosphorus, but it's a phosphate ion that they're right. getting. So let me get this straight. You've got the, the, the plant, the fungus, and the bacteria all living in some kind of mutual symbiosis. Mm -hmm. The bacteria is now uh, generating soluble phosphorus that goes up the fungal hyphae and into the plant, and then in exchange, the hyphae are, are transporting it. In exchange, they are all getting, uh, the, the, the fungus and the bacteria are all getting carbon. Yes. Yeah, well, that's, that's an amazing system. Yeah, well, and, and it's it actually, there's there's another really interesting layer with this as oh, well. Oh my goodness, yes. okay. <laughs> um, And this one, uh, it sort of blows my mind when I think about it, but it's one of the things that is important with some of the soil quality management things we're doing right. with increasing diversity, yes. um, especially doing multi-species yes, in yes, cover yes. crop mixtures mm -hmm. or companion crops. Yes. And the reason this is important is um, you have the rhizobium bacteria, which I know you've, you've talked to other yes. scientists that focus on that. Yes. And they're the nitrogen fixing bacteria and they're mm -hmm. associated with legumes. Yes, yes. Um, in order to fix one molecule of nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, yes. it's a very energetic process. For us, we do it via a fossil fuel process called the okay. Haber-Bosch process. Um, but okay. for the, the bacteria, they need, actually, they need um, phosphorus in order to be able to do this yes. because the, the phosphorus 
is part of that electron transport ATP. chain, okay. the ATP conversion okay. to ADP, right, right, that right. releases the electrons that fire the okay. mitochondria and allow for this reaction to occur. Um, so they need an influx of phosphorus. Yes. And so um, these fungi evolved with the first plants, and mm -hmm. a lot of these plants mm -hmm. were more closely resembling yep. grass-type plants than okay. legume-type plants. Those right. evolved later. Um, but you had the grass-type plants, and part of this mechanism with phosphorus is the grasses encourage the mycorrhizal fungi to absorb a lot of excess phosphorus. Okay. So a lot of excess phosphate, more than the grass needs and more than the fungus needs. Um, and the fungus has the ability to, a lot of times, and this is what happens with roots and why they get nutrient limitations, okay. is because they can only absorb what's, what's right around them and okay. they can only absorb, it's, it's kind of the idea of diffusion, and you mm -hmm, can only mm -hmm. absorb a certain amount and right, then right. you reach the threshold and you can't do any more. Um, the mycorrhizal fungi can actually absorb more phosphorus. They can do it against a gradient, meaning that they don't, the threshold is much higher for them. So they're, in, a sense, in essence, concentrating at almost like a reverse osmosis process. Right, right. Okay, yeah. So the mycorrhizal fungi um, that are associated with the grass will take up excess phosphorus. Okay. Uh, some of that phosphorus will go into the grass plant. Yes. Some of that will stay in the hyphae, and the hyphae can connect the roots of the grass to the roots of a legume. So this hyphae can actually grow into the roots here, but it, wow. then it can grow into the roots of another plant. Okay. So what you end up getting is plants that can be connected to each other, but not via the roots. They're connected via the fungal hyphae. So the hyphae will transfer some of the phosphorus to the legume, Okay, against right. that gradient. So it stimulates excess phosphorus uptake. Excess phosphorus goes into the legume. Yes. From the legume that goes some of that goes into the roots and then into the bacteria, it's the rhizobium, so they can use that to fix nitrogen. Some of the nitrogen that's fixed yes. can actually go back through the the roots into the hyphae, back to the um, grass and into the roots of the grass. So this is kind of like a win-win-win situation for yes. everybody, and it's uh, this. I, I've I've heard of an expression when you sort of start increasing the amount of species you have, it's where two plus two makes six. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's mind blowing. Yes. So it it really is. You yeah. know, it's it's a lot of of again. You you know you'd have these phosphate solubilizing yeah. bacteria. Then you know you have the nitrogen fixing bacteria and the fungal hyphae connecting all of those roots and everything together. So you get you know layers upon layers of symbioses that are occurring in that environment. And I'm assuming that we haven't even begun to understand the first of it. Not too much. Um, and you know a lot of the studies that have been looking at this yes. have been done more under very confined conditions right. in greenhouses and yes. things like that. Okay. So really being able to see some of this stuff happening in the field is is kind of an exciting area okay. um, that that we're going to try and go into um, somewhat. So you don't find it very difficult to get up and come to work in the morning? No, <laughs> I don't at all. No, I, I, it's, it's incredibly interesting right, right. on how all of this stuff works together. It's amazing. Right. Well, let me know if you need a lab assistant. <laughs> so, well, Chris, um, you talked a little bit about studying glomalin uh, or some of the exudates we know that plants exude carbon, I, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're saying is that the mycorrhizal fungi or, uh, also exude certain substances. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about your work in that? Is that the concentration of your work right now? Um, the concentration of my work is sort of divided between kind of looking at glomalin, but also looking at, at soil aggregation. Okay. Because I'm really interested in how that affects some of these dynamics, especially with water and air movement types okay. of issues. We're in a semi-arid environment here, yes. um, but east of us it's more of a, a um, higher rainfall environment okay. in the eastern half of yes. North Dakota. And what I find interesting is the same principles kind of hold up when you build soil structure using these exudates that come 
from, you know, some of them do come from the plants, some of them do come from the mycorrhizal fungi, Got it. some of them come from bacteria, they all form different exudates. Okay. Um, a lot of the stuff that the plant releases, those carbon compounds, um, are uh, a lot of sugar type compounds, so they're very kind of simple carbon compounds mm -hmm. that are provide a lot of energy to the bacteria or to the the fungi that are associated with those roots. So the plant then uses photosynthesis and exudes these sugars that attracts certain microbes to it that, that it will then interact with. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you have it's it's um, the zone that's right around the roots is called the rhizosphere. Yes. And that's where there's a heavy concentration of these sugars and a lot of concentration of microbial activity. Yes. Um, and then those sugars can be taken out by you know the bacteria, the fungi, and used as an energy source. Mm -hmm. And also the carbon pr provides the building blocks for the formation of some of these exudates that are given off. Got it. Um, and the glomalin that um, is one of the big areas of my research. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to work with a, fellow scientists at ARS, um, Sarah Wright, who's since retired, who yes. sort of started the identification of, of glomalin. Um, and uh, it, it happened in a little bit of reverse of what normally happens when you're looking for things. Yes. Um, she was actually trying to find antibodies that were species specific. Okay. Um, the fungal hyphae looks the same no matter what type of species of the fungus it is. Okay. Um, so the only way to distinguish species is with spores and not all of the fungi sporulate readily so it's hard to know what the diversity of the fungi are yes, in the yes. soil system and what may be some of the better fungi so if you um, there's a lot of interest in trying to create commercial inoculum or okay. things like that and you want to select for the species that are going to be the most beneficial. Got it. But in order to be able to do that, you need to know what the species are right. that are in the system you're looking at. Yes. Um, so she was actually looking um, to, to try and be able to identify them and using um, immunological techniques. So she used antibodies mm -hmm. that would bind um, okay. to these different species of fungi. Um, and it, it didn't turn out to be very successful, but one of the things she discovered along the way was this glomalin. It seemed like there was this abundance of this material um, along the fungal hyphae and okay. around colonized roots. And then um, did a lot of work in trying to be able to extract and analyze this glomalin and then um, kind of doing a lot of work in correlating that with things like soil aggregation. Yes. And the unique part of, of the glomalin is it's a glycoprotein, which means it's a sugared protein. protein. Um, and those sugar groups can be very good, just like most carbohydrates, it's kind of, I call it like chewing gum. Okay. So they're very, very sticky. Um, uh, and uh, okay, yeah. for a long time, we thought aggregation was a phenomenon primarily driven by polysaccharides. Yes. Um, so the, so the sugars, sugars, the yeah, sticky right, sugars. Right, right, right. Uh, part of the issue with the sticky sugars is, is just like sugar, it will dissolve in water. It. So it may not convey the level of stability to the aggregates mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. you could get by doing this combination of having a molecule that part of it is a sticky sugar yes. and part of it is a protein. and a lot of those proteins appear to have a lot of what's called hydrophobicity or water hating. Right, right. And when you have things that have hydrophobicity, they can sort of create like a waxy type yeah. of thing that water won't penetrate. So it won't wash well. away if the water gets uh, saturated, if the soil gets saturated. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, and and the implication for farmers of glomalin. I mean, what? How does that translate to someone who's farming? Why would a farmer care about glomalin? Well, a, a farmer would care about glomalin from from the standpoint of uh, glomalin functioning to help to sort of increase the efficiency of this relationship for the fungal hyphae to get those nutrients. Um, it's very nice for the fungal hyphae to be able to 
uh, be the, the, the framework around the aggregates. Yes. And those aggregates will form. And I think of those aggregates sometimes as kind of like time-release fertilizer pellets because wow. the organic matter that's in those aggregates yes. is going to be broken down primarily by bacteria because they're the only ones small enough to penetrate the aggregate. Mm -hmm. And that bacteria then will feed that to the fungus and the fungus will take that right back to the plant. Right. Um, a lot of the, uh, some of the organic matter and nutrients that are free in the soil, yes. those get consumed fairly readily by larger microorganisms nematodes and, and protozoa and things right. like that right. um, and you know even earthworms you know help to break that down Got it. but because they're so large they consume a lot more of it than yeah. than the bacteria will um, okay. the bacteria are very numerous but you know their numbers can compensate for size slightly yes. but not as much right, for, right, for right. size so okay. it allows for the bacteria to sort of slowly be working and chewing on the organic matter that's inside the aggregates and releasing those nutrients over time. So like I said, a time release fertilizer pellet inside yes. those aggregates. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the aggregates, uh, they're pellets that are in the soil and yes. between those pellets you're going to have spaces because they're not going to fit together like a puzzle piece. It's yeah. like a puzzle where all of the um, little ends were cut off. So you, know, you can kind of fit it in there, but you're going to have open space. And so uh, it allows for that open space that water's going to get in more quickly into the soil. And because the, the way that that fits together, it curves and bends around the aggregates. It's okay. not a straight column type of thing. Not One of the things that we've done um, for a number of years is uh, people will aerate their soil or try and get water penetration. Mechanically aerated? Mechanically yes, aerated. Yes. Um, sometimes it's done via tillage. Uh, in uh, yards or gardens, it's, it's done by some equipment that will basically poke holes in, in the soil. The problem with that is it's a straight column that the water would be going in. Yeah. And so it's very readily evaporated out of that column by um, the work of, of sun the sunlight hitting the surface of, of the soil. So it very quickly evaporates. It. If it bends and curves around the aggregates, it's almost like a straw that you bent. Crumpled and, yeah. and And so when you bend the straw, obviously it takes you a whole lot more um, strong sucking in order to be able to get the liquid out. The same thing happens in the soil, so more water is held in that soil for a longer period of time. Is that called tortuosity coefficient? I remember doing that. In, in yeah, <laughs> it's it's something yeah along those lines. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, that's that's amazing. Well, um, okay. Now you've as a farmer, you've just convinced me that glomalin's a good thing. Well, well let me ask you this: glomalin uh, is that the primary? W what you're seeing is the primary biochemical substance that's kind of doing the soil aggregate holding, or is it just one of many? Um, well, it, it seems to be one of the major ones. Okay. Um, one of the th issues with glomalin is um, it, it's hard to know for sure if all of it is, is mycorrhizal in origin. Got it. And there's also a lot of what happens in the soil environment mm -hmm. is there's interactions. So th you're talking about interactions with glomalin? Yeah. yeah. And, and um, various chemicals that are going to be in the soil yeah. so the nutrients and minerals and those types of things um, and and so there may be uh, some different a number of different types of glomalin mm -hmm. um, or a number of different sort of structures of glomalin yeah. um, what's unique about proteins is uh, they fold into these 3d types of structures okay and those 3d structures uh, can change some of their properties so sometimes when it's, there's more water in the soil, uh, the protein will fold so more of the hydrophobic amino acids are on the outside okay. to protect the protein. Yes. Whereas in other cases, when it's, when it's dried out or something like that, it'll fold, it'll unfold it'll and then the refold other yeah. the other way. So more yeah. of the carbohydrates are exposed to, yeah. to get that. So it's, what, uh, and that's to absorb more water for? Yeah, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's really difficult to be able to, to kind of study some of this stuff 
um, yeah. in situ and in, in so, inside the soil or right. even you know under some limited controlled conditions yeah. um, but y y we're, we're looking at having the the glomalin in the soil um, as being one of the primary things for aggregation Got it. Uh, and that's a lot of more with macro aggregates or aggregates that are larger than uh, 0.25 millimeters mm -hmm. um, in the micro aggregates there's because they're so small um, there's more of a role for bacteria and clay minerals and right. other things like that. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that go into aggregation and it depends on what size of aggregates you're looking at. Um, you know, and, and so one of the things that we're finding with agricultural production types of systems is because the scomalin is a, a carbon-based molecule. Yes. Uh, and it get the fungus in order to be able to produce it gets carbon from the plant. Okay. Uh, the plant is going to give carbon to the fungus if it has a direct, a, a direct, direct benefit. benefit. Right. It's not going to do that because it's charitable donations or something. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is initially uh, the the carbon is devoted to forming more fungal hyphae and getting out into the soil okay. and getting more absorption, yes. those types of things. Um, and then if there's a long enough growing season or a long enough period of time of photosynthetic activity, you can start getting the formation of some of these secondary compounds okay. like glomalin because it, it's sort of, you know, the, the fungus wants to create these aggregates because it's a more efficient way for it to be able okay. to get the nutrients. Yep. but it first needs to satisfy the plant needs yes. in order to be able to get yeah. that carbon. To get more carbon, more sugar. Well, it, how would I um, encourage these mutualistic relationships? How would I encourage fungi if I were farming row crops? How would I encourage this kind of biology to happen in my soils? Um, well, again, you know, one of the things you want to do is you want to reduce the amount of disturbance of the soil. Okay. Uh, because these hyphal networks, they're fairly fragile yeah. in the soil environment. So now we got a square on there. Um, anyway, they're fairly fragile in the soil environment. Like I said, you know, there's more of it that extends out here, but it was kind of ripped off in the process of, of isolating these roots. Yeah. And when you do tillage, uh, that disturbance actually breaks up these hyphal networks. And so then every year, instead of being able to tap into an existing network and being able to maybe produce some of the secondary compounds like glomalin, glomalin. Um, the fungus is in a constant regeneration process. It's constantly so it's trying to regrow and colonize the soil. So basically f first stage of succession each time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, so, so you want to reduce the amount of disturbance, and yes. that's doing things like no-till planting, yeah. um, those types of things. And then, like I said, we want to get more photosynthetic activity. Okay. So is there something you can do to either extend the growing season or add some diversity so you're getting um, a lot of different types of sugars that are produced? So that's where we come in looking at things like cover crops okay. or companion crops. Right. So yeah, it's a it's a complex relationship right, to, right. to try and be able to stimulate these. Okay. Um, so okay. So um, if we're if we're tilling and disturbing the soil habitat all the time, they're still there, but they're spending all their time recolonizing what was disturbed last year. Right. Right. Uh, yet, and if they're in a system where that's not disturbed, they've recolonized and they're spending a lot more energy producing things like glomalin which then really contribute to the soil structure and I guess organic matter content to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's, that's what you want to have going on. Got it. Um, you know, there are also some plants that are considered to be non-mycorrhizal. Yes. Uh, about Burst 80 to 90 percent of all vascular plants or crop plants are mycorrhizal. Um, I.e. they have a mutualistic relationship with mycorrhizae. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then you have things like you said, like the brassicas that are, yes. uh, a lot of them are not associated with the mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of our other recommendations is to, to kind of limit the, the use of, of brassicas or to use them uh, in a rotation or, you know, if you want to do some things where you've got 
uh, if you've got things in this area, we grow a lot of canola, um, which is a, a non-mycorrhizal. Okay. Uh, it's a rape plant that's, right, right. that's not mycorrhizal. Um, and, and so are there some things you can do with, you know, again, cov cover crops or companion crops um, or even just maybe putting in some strips that are sort of like mycorrhizal shelter belts throughout your okay. field. So yeah. you do, you do, you know, one pass would be canola and mm -hmm. then the next pass would be, you know, a mycorrhizal crop yes. and then, you know, kind of oh, stripping cool. it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so you're, so you're able, like I said, to create a shelter belt or, or yeah. a little reservoir for the mycorrhizal fungi. So they kind of remain there and grow there and, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. yeah. That, that is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, 